uh, thank you all for being part of the second human performance webinar, Lunch and Learn. I appreciate you all being here today with us. Uh, so today we're going to talk about leadership response to failure. And in an attempt to be completely transparent, <laughs> um, I did a pretty major revision uh, last night and this morning. Um, had a meeting with a customer at lunch yesterday, and he was asking a lot of questions about what do you do after you have an incident? So I took the time to reflect on what is really working for us. So I essentially transitioned from what might have been a Todd Conklin type talk to sharing with you today the reality of what's working for us. And I don't wanna pretend like we have all the answers. We don't have all the answers, but what we do have is we are finding some successes with applying new view safety in a very high risk environment. And so today I'm gonna to share with you from my heart, some of the things that we've learned and some of the things that are working as well as some things that aren't working. In the first Lunch and Learn, we started with a discussion about adaptive capacity. So now we're on that second phase of leadership response to failure. So I will tell you this, when we started our human performance journey, we spent a, almost the entire first year focused exclusively on leadership response to failure. So all of these other things, as you look up this uh, roadmap that we've gone along, just know that we spent about a year on just leadership response to failure. So where did we come from? We came from doing behavior-based safety very well. And what we found is that that wasn't good enough. And what do, what do we mean when we say that? What we mean is that um, rules and policies are important. They're absolutely important. I don't wanna give the impression that they're not, but they're not enough to keep us safe. And one of the other things that we've discovered as we've gone on this journey is that behavior-based safety is really a good for, fit for factory work. So behavior-based safety is really a good fit for an environment where you, you have more control over the environment. You have control over the heat, you've got control over the lighting, um, and your work is, is uh, perhaps more re repeatable. Our work is very, very different than that. And so when what we are sharing with you is what we have found to work for a highly variable work environment and highly variable work. This statement that you're seeing right now is part of our event learning. And this was part of what came out of the conversation uh, with the customer yesterday. He said, where do you start? And this is actually where we start. And it's fundamental. So the point of this is that we truly believe that learning is the key to keeping people safe. And those are not just words that we put on paper. There are a lot of actions that come behind it. It permeates everything we do and it's a significant change. I don't wanna minimize the significance of this. It means we questioned everything. It meant that we stopped doing some things temporarily. For example, we actually stopped doing incident reviews temporarily. Uh, we morphed our safety leadership call to more of a learning type call where we were talking about human performance and risk versus incidents. We did restart our incident review calls and I'll share that with you. Um, we shed things. We stopped talking as much about incident rates and we re-envisioned and reshaped pretty much all the work of safety. So, how do we start out? And this, I'm gonna give my, my boss and our CEO, Tom, a lot of credit for this because when he brought me on board at Lewis three years ago, he said, I'm not looking for you to come up with any elaborate plans or strategies now. I just want you to come in, I want you to be with us. And so what did that look like? What it looked like at first was being on the incident review calls that were still, um, still a heavily behavior-based safety and looking for opportunities for us to learn and looking for opportunities to insert some of the human performance and the, the human factors um, wherever we were. And so it was kind of an interesting situation because we had the flexibility of whatever we were discussing being relevant to where, whatever the team was working on, for example, whatever incident might have occurred. But the other thing that happened is 
it felt a little bit disconnected. So I'm not going to say whether this is a good place to start or not. I'm not sure it worked for us, but about a year in, we said, okay, people are not seeing the connection of all these things. Let's take it, let's take some time and glue it all together. So roughly a year in, we actually did our first formal training on human performance. And we did that with a joint workshop with uh, safety and with the operations group. We brought in Bob Edwards, might be a familiar name to some folks. We brought in Ron Gamp and Asher Bach and the safety researcher from OSU who we've been working with. We brought them all in and we said, okay, how do we glue it all together? And we created what we call our local leader playbook which we still refer to often. And in that playbook are some of the fundamentals of how you shift your perspective on safety. And we'll talk about a few of those now. The other thing that we did is we established a foundation with uh, Todd Conklin's pre-accident investigations book. We did a guided study group and uh, invited senior leaders, safety team and emerging leaders to be part of it. Each group had three leads, which were a person from safety, an external expert, and uh, someone from operations. About a year later, we circled through it again. And the, each of the regional vice presidents led chapter studies on, or chapter reviews on pre-accident investigation. And right now, our safety team is cycling through it again. So the point of this is you establish a foundation, but then you've got to revisit it time and time and time again. Uh, so we're now in our either third or fourth iteration of going through pre-accident investigations. This kind of summarizes, what does it mean when you're doing safety differently? And when we talk about safety differently, again, taking us back to the fact that we're doing safety for highly variable work. How does that change? How does that change how you create safety? Um, it changes it by focusing a lot on creating the presence of capacity. Capacity can take a lot of different forms. In fact, we spoke about that during the last webinar. So I invite you to go back and, and uh, listen to that one if you'd like to learn more about it. But some forms that that capacity takes is time. So it may look like pressing pause or actually inserting um, uh, uh, not... Uh, what not just if you have a really complex job, you say, okay, we're going to stop here and we're going to check in how things are going. Or it can look like knowledge and experience, either deepening the knowledge and experience of the individuals or bringing in the experience of someone else. Because we often talk a lot about bringing in a fresh set of eyes. It also switches significantly from the worker being the problem to the worker being the problem solver. And that's going to show up in a lot of the things um, that I'm going to share with you. Major paradigm shift here. And this is actually some of Eric Holnagel's work. So Eric Holnagel, uh, who is one of the leading thinkers in this domain called resilience engineering, which I'm part of, uh, said this. And it's one of those things that once you hear it, you're like, man, that makes sense. Um, I don't know why we didn't think about that before. And the major paradigm shift is that most of the time when people are working, they are accomplishing work safely. And what Eric likes to say is that during that, that green, all that time, all that normal work that, that is being done safely, you, some people would say nothing happens. But actually there's a lot happening during that green part of the circle. And what's happening is that people are adapting, they're adjusting, they're figuring out how to get work done safely. And that's happening all the time. So when we're thinking about how do we want to create safety, we want to broaden from looking at that little teeny red sliver where we have the absence of safety to looking at normal work and work that goes well, because we want more of the good. So now I'm going to get into, I guess, some of the things that we put into place at Lewis that have been essential for us. And this one, the relentless pursuit to eliminate serious injury and fatality. I wanna tell you how this shows up for us in real life. The way that it shows up for us in real life is in trade-offs. Um, in fact, there have been, I've had many conversations, including some recently with uh, one of the safety managers that works for me and other leaders at Lewis 
of why don't we, you know, why don't we, why don't we um, broaden serious injury to include uh, serious loss for the business? Um, the other thing that that has come up is um, maybe we should maybe we should broaden and we should start also considering slip strips and falls and focusing on trying to reduce slip slip strips and falls. Or should we begin to uh, also work on ergonomics? And my stand, right or wrong, and it may change with time, I don't know, but my stand right now is that the work that we do is so high risk. The work that we do, we are at still such a high risk for serious injury and fatality that I, I feel like, at least for the time being, that needs to be our beacon. And when that's our beacon, it means that we're trading off. It means that we're not talking about those other things that I just said uh, very often, if at all. It's a deliberate focus. It's a very deliberate focus on serious injury and fatality. And the other way that it shows up is when we have a serious injury or serious injury close call, potential close call, we ask ourselves, could this have been a fatality? And if the answer is yes, then we hit the road we go. And that just happened actually pretty recently. And um, we go, we go to site and we learn everything that we can. So if it's serious injury, potential fatality, we treat it like it's a fatality. That is the level with which we respond. And that's how that shows up for us in real life. Mantra number one. Okay, so I actually looked up the definition of the word mantra because it felt to me like this was a mantra and I'm like, okay, I'm using that word, but what does it mean? So the word mantra essentially means mind and tool. Mon is mind and tra is tool. It literally means a tool for the mind designed to help practitioners access a higher power in their true natures. So we use this, everyone comes to work to do a good job. We say it all the time. We say it all the time because it's, it, it is keeping us, um, it's, a, it's a tool for our mind to keep us focused on the belief that everyone comes to work to do a good job. We say it before we go investigate an incident. We say it um, during incident reviews. This is our, it's our centering mantra. And our other one is this. Number two, approach with curiosity. What does this mantra mean? It means we always go in with an open mind and an open heart. And we have found time after time after time that we, there was some preconceived notion of what had happened. But when we go in like this, we always, 100% always, and, I, and there is no exception, we don't discover things that are really important to helping us figure out how, how to better manage that risk. So I didn't put this down as a mantra, but I will tell you that this is something that um, when we investigate incidents that I challenge the safety team to do. And I say, we, we aren't done until we understand why it made sense. Because I've heard a lot of times, in fact, I heard it pretty often at Lewis when I came, we don't understand why they made those decisions. Why did they make those at-risk decisions? You know, and that, um, lead you down a path where you're pretty focused on the frontline worker in a, in a bit of a, a, a blaming tone. It leads you down a path that closes thinking. And so Sydney Decker calls it get into the tunnel. And so with this, what it does is when we, if we, if we can't get to the point where it made sense to us that they made that decision, then, then we know we've got to go deeper. And by going deeper, what happens? It moves us to empathy and it helps us understand something really important. The photos that you're looking at behind this on the screen right now were from a recent incident. Now, in the, in the one on the left, you're looking from the perspective of the bucket operator. What do you see when you look down at the ground? You can't see anything, right? And when you look at the, the scene from the right, you're actually seeing what the scene looked like from the person on the ground. You can't even see the bucket. And so it, when, we, when we looked at this from both of those perspectives, we understood better how this incident occurred. And we talk a lot about perspective shifts and that being important. And this is a really prime example of a perspective shift coming in the form of physical location. I expect that 
many of you who are listening are familiar with the black line, blue line, red line model. This is actually some work from Todd Conklin. So the black line is policy or procedure, the blue line is actual work, and the red line is risk. And they're always changing. That's one of the important things about it here. But I want to take you somewhere a little bit different than maybe you've been before with this model. Um, so this might surprise you, but the goal is not to bring the blue line onto the black line. Again, I'm going to say it again. The goal is not to bring the blue line or actual work onto the black line work as planned or designed. The goal is to understand the the, the where the blue line is. The goal is to understand what's happening on the blue line. And I actually had a pretty cool conversation uh, with Brett Kent this morning who, hey Brett, sitting across the table, thanks for this one, um, about, about this model. And let's just walk through an example of how we apply this and, and how it's working for us. So we had a, um, we had a pretty serious uh, struck by event about two weeks ago. And I will tell you the person is okay. You know, thank, thank goodness the person is okay. And our first go-to position on that was we've got to reinforce the drop zone policy. We've got to get better at managing the drop zone. We've got to get better at three-way communication. All that's good. All that is good stuff. And we don't want to say it isn't good. But the point is, it's not enough to keep us safe. And so when we talk about staying close to the blue line, what that means is that in on top of that, that policy, we want to layer on defenses, we want to layer on knowledge. And one of the things that we want to understand is, and you can see the comment on the right was that, which actually, I think, Dennis, I think this comment came from you, was we couldn't imagine why the team didn't have their headsets on. But when we asked, we heard about 15 answers, and they all made sense, and we wouldn't have thought of any of them. So the closer we can get to Designing on the blue line, in other words, designing our layers of defense, our actions that we take to get better, the closer we can get to the blue line, the better off we'll, we'll be. The, the, the more it increases the odds that we'll actually be able to drive small changes that will nudge us forward to being safer and safer and safer. And Brett, did you, you're looking at me, did you have anything on this one? No, just that I agree. Okay, thank you. Brett agrees. <laughs> Forward-looking accountability. One thing that gets brought up a lot with, um, with New View Safety and switching this heavily to a learning position is um, how are we going to hold people accountable? And we, <laughs> this statement that you see across the top of the screen, you can learn or you can blame, but you can't do, do both. Believe me, that was very highly and hotly debated by us and may still continue to be hotly debated. But one thing that we know for sure is that when you take a blaming tone, even a little bit of a blaming tone, you are driving learning underground. You're not learning as much as you could be learning and we can never get better by knowing less. And so one way of looking at accountability, and this is some uh, Sydney Decker work, is to um, hold, ask people to, to tell their account of what happened. Tell us the story of what happened and really focus on who's hurt, what do they need, and whose obligation is it to help them. So this is very much a service-centered um, a service -centered leadership, very much a, um, a learning by hearing their story, including the details of the story that will help us share the story in a way that can evoke emotion and drive change and help people remember this story. And that's how we get better. So counterfactuals, we talked about counterfactuals a lot the first year and we still loop around and we still challenge ourselves periodically when we're on our incident review calls to avoid counterfactuals. What is a counterfactual? It simply means counter to the facts. So counterfactual is when people are saying, well, they should have done that, they could have done that, the worker failed to do this, if only they'd done this other thing, then the incident wouldn't have happened. Well, the problem with that is it's not focusing on what actually happened. And to really get better, we have to focus on what actually happened. What, what did people think was going on? What was their focus? What was their experience? 
What were they trying to do when they did it? And I, the quote on the bottom right, by the way, as you see these quotes on my screen, please know that they're real quotes from our leaders at Lewis Tree. Often Dennis, our COO and president, or Tom, our CEO. So the one on the right of the screen right now is actually from Tom, our CEO. And he said, this sounds like the risk continued to stack. There was large wood, bad weather, chips were blowing toward the ground person. The mode of communication changed, their headsets were down. They went from crisp and clear communication to hand signals. I wasn't there. I don't want to second guess. So now I'm gonna take you a little bit on our, uh, our journey. And as we go through this, some things we left behind, other things we built upon. So what the screen that you're looking at right now, when we started out, we were very tactical and counterfactual um, in our incident investigations. In fact, I'm sitting here with one of our division managers who shared with me that he hated to be on the incident review calls at that point in time because it was very much a, a trying to figure out uh, who did something wrong. And we know now that that closes down learning. Um, at that time, uh, we described the worker as L slash E, Lewis employee, so it was very depersonalized. If we did root cause at all, it was very linear and shallow. And we also, at that time, had automatic uh, punishment in place, which is if they violated a nine to no, they would automatically get three days without pay or fired. We don't do that anymore. So once we began our journey, and by the way, those are the things we left behind, if that's not already obvious. <laughs> um, once we began our journey, we really uh, focused a lot on getting the voice of the worker. And I love some of these questions he here. And this, Dennis, this is one that you said so many times, and I loved it every time I heard it. And it was, what were they trying to accomplish? What did the worker say? Because at, at that point in time, we were still getting incident reports, which we call after action reviews, that left out the voice of the worker. And they were still kind of telling the perspective of what happened from the perspective of the leadership who were involved. So we kept going, okay, what did the worker say? What did they say? What did, how were they surprised? What were they trying to accomplish? And we were trying to bring forth the trade-off decisions that workers might face as they tried to work through situations, such as what are the pressures you face if we take this truck out of service? Dennis, I know you're out there. I'm going to check in with you on this one. Is there anything you'd like to add on this one? Hey, Beth, can you hear me? Can hear you and see you, Dennis. You know, I think the only thing that I could add to this is, you know, as you're taking us through the script, I can only imagine how painful it was. And you have a couple of operational folks there when we were heavily focused on behavior-based safety because we didn't think our work was done until we could effectively compartmentalize what happened and assign blame. That's what I think is it was about we, we needed to as an organization so that we could tidy it up and then move on. What I really love about where we are now is um, truly when we're doing an incident review and we're having close calls and sharing those out is our teams are, there's one rule and it's come to us uh, authentically and genuine and share honestly what occurred, um, no repercussions. And we are hearing such fantastic reasons why people are making the choices that they're making. Um, and leadership, myself, Tom, the operational vice presidents, Beth's team, we are just so focused on encouraging the people and placing value on those conversations that um, we're getting better and better participation. We're getting deeper and deeper learning. And when we hold up our end of the bargain, um, people tend to just, it just, it force multiplies out there. Is the only thing I can add, Beth, is that it force multiplies. And it's keeping our commitment to leadership's response to failures. You know, we're focusing more on the 99%, the green diagram that Beth showed us. We're focusing in those interactions on the 99% of the time that work went well. And we're making these people feel like we understand. So we're making our craft workers know we understand um, things can go wrong out there. There was a slide that Beth showed. And I think the biggest learning for me as an operational leader was we can never engineer out of our work um, the surprises or the variability 
all we can do it team it took me so long to grasp this concept and understand it all we can do is focus on our adaptive capacity and our resiliency so that our teams can be better identifiers of when work is not going well we're going to be surprised every day several times a day that's when it's so important for safety to be present that's what these conversations help us to learn um, increasing our adaptive capacity strengthening our resilience we're able to react and we're able to do it safely so thank you beth i appreciate the opportunity to share there Thank you, Dennis, and stay on because I we're going to leadership shaping questions and yeah. I'd love for you to contribute here. So if if you'd like to speak to this, that would be great. Um so early on, um, you know, Beth was as we were going through and we were making this change into HP safety and how we were uh how we would learn more from each event and each incident. I think personally, this was a this was a big mover for me. This was a game changer for me. We learned as an organization, and what the leadership at Lewis Tree Service is learning is we're trying to teach the rest of our leaders how to ask these questions. Um, you know, there's one in here. There's a story behind every cut boot, cut chap, cut glove. We have to dig them out. This was an exercise that we delivered out to the organization. We were getting on weekly calls with operational management teams. And instead of saying, you know, let's inspect chaps, chaps, we really wanted to find out when you see a pair of chaps that has a cut in them, uh, when you see a pair of boots that is cut at the toe and at the sole, find out the story, ask a question, ask an open-ended question and mine that story out. So we moved into, it's hard for people to share automatically what's going on, but if we can mine these through really good, curious questions, um, so picture yourself being on a crew and somebody asking you that, you would know exactly what happened at the time that those pair of chaps were cut, um, those boots were cut. And if you're asking right, you'd be willing to share that story. So we're learning and we're teaching people um, the importance of sharing close calls and, uh, and also for sharing stories about what happened. So these are just examples of questions that, uh, once again, they reinforce our promise to our to our teammates that we're gonna learn from every event that occurs out there, that we're not gonna have automatic discipline um, and that we're gonna help them to tell us the narrative that's going on. So Beth, that's, that'd be my sharing on that slide. Thank you, Dennis. And so if you haven't already figured it out, um, very, I'm gonna just say, I feel very, very lucky to be leading safety at Lewis. Uh, with Dennis and Tom, because the questions that they come up with and how they lead our incident review and close call reviews are, I'm just going to say, incredible. So what, a, what have I been doing with that as a uh, safety leader and also on the side, a little bit of a safety researcher? I've been keeping uh, uh, pretty much verbatim uh, notes of the dialogues that we have on those calls. So I took a minute and I went back out and I'm like, okay, what, what are the themes here? And I went back and looked at all the questions that have been asked over some period of time and pulled the questions out. And so what are these, what are the themes of these questions? And I actually created this. I don't know if you can see, if you can see this. And it's a document that um, has the themes of the questions. And so they fell into these buckets. Uh, some of the questions were helping us uh, notice the trade-offs that were occurring. Other ones were demonstrating caring and empathy. Uh, they were modeling humility and recognizing engaged leadership. So very much a positive reinforcing that this is the, these are the actions, this is the type of leadership that we want. They prompted new thinking and actions. Um, things like how would you go about, um, how would you, what would this look like, uh, in, you know, with your crews? Um, what are the three or four things that you do every day to create safety? They reinforce new view safety, they seek the worker perspective, they show appreciation for the worker. How many times have you successfully removed trees this past year? The answer was about 2000. Thank you for that. Um, they support noticing risk, taking a system view and trigger learning. So those are the general themes or buckets that showed up for me when I did this analysis post um, quite a few of these calls. So what I'll, I guess what I'm going to offer you on that one is a lot of this is about leading with questions and the questions that you ask 
matter a lot. So as Dennis mentioned, teaching our leaders how to ask these type of questions, which at, at fundamentally they're open-ended, but beyond that, they're helping probe and shape culture in those areas that I just described. Last but not least here, yeah, this is something where I'm noticing uh, this recently on our calls. I'm noticing more and more on our incident review and close call reviews that we're really exploring and understanding the complexity of our world and of our work. And this was actually a question that Brett Kent asked on a call that he was leading recently. And um, he said, it, it, here's the situation. Let me just draw the scenario out for you. We had a large dead ash, multiple leaders that were on a down line. The crew had worked all day and they're called out in the middle of the night in cold weather in the Northeast to take off this huge dead multi-liter ash that was hanging over the, the road. So I hope you can get the picture of what, what happened here. So brought everyone to bear. The general foreman was on site. They talked about it. They made a great plan. They made a good plan. They talked through the plan. And then the bucket operator went up. The bucket operator started to make his first cut. His first cut was not in accordance with what they had planned on the ground. The general foreman said, he goes, he goes I know everything looks different from the air. Very, very true, right? It's not surprising that things change, that the plan changes when we get into the bucket, into the tree. What would probably be surprising is if the plan didn't change when you get in the bucket or in the tree. And so what the GF was reflecting on during this call, he said, he goes, I felt like I should have intervened. I kept asking, should I have intervened before he made that cut? And then one of the things that Brett shared on this call, he said, you had to decide whether or not to interrupt work. You're in a pretty gray area there. It's intense, right? You can imagine the intensity of the moment. And so what Brett invited all the leaders on the call to do was to ask ourselves, how do we engage with uncertainty? Uh, for those of you who have been part of our conversations before, you may know that we have this thing called an uncertainty gauge. So we talk a lot about uncertainty. Um, so Brett was saying, how do we ourselves as leaders engage with uncertainty? Where's our uncertainty gauge? And when do we say, whoa, hang on, stop, let's pause. So wrapping up. <laughs> Um, this was a, uh, I think Laura came up with this file under things you thought you'd never hear. We were on a recent close call review and one of the general foremen who was reporting out, he said, our team was really jazzed that the close call we sent in was selected for this call. And for us, it felt like another step change in progress to hear that. We were a little surprised that we heard it excited that we heard it. And then the comment on the bottom right is something that Tom, our CEO said once he once that comment was made. He said, we talk about learning, your crews will learn from this close call. That's the power here, we want to multiply. And so I hope that as we've gone through this leadership response to failure, that you can see that it is all grounded and founded on learning, that learning was woven through it all, learning from the front line, learning about complex work, learning about the blue line, how work is actually occurring. And I want to, um, before we go to the questions, um, if someone wants to get CE, CEUs for this webinar, this is how you do it. An email will be followed up that'll give you this information as well. So watch for that email if you want to get CEUs for the webinar. And with that, our next, next Lunch and Learn, uh, we're gonna talk about learning loops, drills, and storytelling on January 19th at noon. I'm gonna come back out of sharing my screen to see if there are any questions. I think we're scheduled to go until one o'clock if anyone would like to stay until one. Um, yeah, and Beth, we, we have yeah. one question that's come in from uh -huh. Bert Stu Stewart has asked, he said, approaches to human performance appears complex, yet is straightforward, honest communication in parentheses. How has the needle moved since implementing this level of engagement across the company? Um, hang on a second. I'm trying to multitask here and we can't multitask. So <laughs> <laughs> we can only switch tasks. Okay, I'm back with you. I'm sorry, Steve, what was the question? And basically, the question is, how has the needle moved since implementing this level of engagement across the company? 
And, you know, that's an interesting question because how has the needle, needle moved? The needle's moved in so many ways. I mean, I'm going to just say that I, I think it's too early to make any calls with respect to um, result. And if you want to talk about serious incidents, which has been our guiding light, seems like they're less frequent, but we, you never reach that pinnacle. Brett and I talked about this this morning. You know, we will never get there. We've got to continually enter injury, enter, enter energy there. We always, it's always energy in. We will never reach the pinnacle. We're ne we'll never be finished with that. So, but are we moving the needle to having fewer? I think so. It's early. Dennis? Uh, yeah, if I could just add to that. Yeah. Here, here's where we're moving the needle. We're building a foundation of trust. So we're moving the needle first in the area that we have to, to continue to build sustainability in the results. And what we shared today was we're creating an, a culture that uh, leadership and the craft worker trust one another implicitly. They are relying on each other and depending on each other. You know, also at the same time that we've embarked on this journey, we have, we are looking, we in, we engage with uh, work care, which is a third party um, uh, workplace claim management group. So we are out there, we're mining every injury that we've had. We wanna know at the end of the day, who's feeling discomfort, what's going on. So we're showing our care for our employees as well. With, if, it's a, if it's a sore knee or a poison ivy, we're using that program and we're calling it in and we're making sure that we're providing treatment. So um, if you're just counting the number of times we're talking about things occurring, you might say, hey, you're not moving the needle, but we're really focused on learning everything that's going on out there. I agree with Beth. We're having success in the area, in the arena of serious injury and fatality. Um, the other piece that I think is really important um, to, mess, to mention outside of the culture is the way that we're grooming leadership as well in this. So, I, you know, it's hard when we talk about uh, moving the needle. The other thing that we've employed is we've created a system of learning loops that supports this. So when Beth and early on was saying, we're not gonna get distracted, we're not gonna be pulled off of our, um, what we think is the most important and the things that are gonna help us to eliminate serious injuries and fatalities from our workplace. And that's these five work, these five learning loops. And they focus on struck buys. They focus on line of fire. They focus on uh, safe vehicle operation fall from heights and uh, minimum approach distance. So making sure that we're avoiding electrical contact. If we can be good in these five areas and we repeat and we repeat and we repeat, we're gonna drive those right out of our workplace. So as Beth said, it's a little early. We know we can feel it because we felt what it was like before. Um, all the data is gonna catch up to that. So I hope that's the best answer that I can give team. Uh, James Berry had his hand raised. Yeah, and there's another question too. Um, okay. So I don't know if this is the one that came in from James or not, but one question, and I'll see if James takes one here too. It says, is discipline, uh, again, in parentheses, time off, never used post-incident or is there criteria when it is used? Yeah, so actually I had, uh, we have an event decision tree that I had in this presentation earlier and I took it out. Um, because we use it, I think it's important. It's also not uncommon. Uh, so it's based on James Reason work and it's, a, it's an event decision tree. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys probably have event decision trees and I don't think it's been the most important thing that we've done. It is, it is key and we do use it before we um, administer discipline, but we're finding that, I don't know, I think we're going down that path less frequently. I don't know, Dennis. What, what have you noticed with that? We have moved, I'll say this, we have moved effectively away from automatic discipline. We evaluate every, that's a promise we made to our workforce. Um, if they will be honest with us and help us to learn from these events, there will not be automatic discipline. Um, that does not say if we see willful negligence or we see people that intentionally want to do harm to others and to the company, then we have that event decision tree to, you know, to, uh, to direct us. The one place where you will see discipline um, would be before an event occurs. So if we're measuring, uh, if we've laid our expectations out 
and we've telegraphed to the organization that these things are important and it's important that we be compliant in our policies and we see repeat offenders, then it's time to take action, but never after an event. So Beth, if you want to call on James Berry, I think you can ask, allow him to, to ask a question. I think you have to click on him on the right-hand side and, or James, if you want to type it in. Yeah, I don't see, a, I can't really see the participants with the screen I'm looking at, so. Your hand up, okay. Um, let's see if we can. Arliss Drake asked a question. So um, James Bear, if you wouldn't mind typing it in, that'd be fantastic. And let's go to Arliss's question. Cause I heard uh, someone else said they had the same question as Arliss. And the question was, have you encountered naysayers in the organization or pockets of resistance? And how did you respond to those? Uh, I'd say there's not a one size fits all. Um, I know with respect to the safety team, we've had uh, some safety team members who were old school and they came, they, th as we spent more time with it, they kind of went, huh, yeah, you know, this is making sense. And so they kind of came along of their own accord and maybe with some, uh, some conversations where we kind of worked with them through it, worked with them through the thinking. Um, I don't know, Dennis, would you, do you have thoughts on that one? I do. Um, there were pockets of naysayers. And I think the one of the best ways that we identified early on where we might have those would be, as Beth had mentioned, we brought the entire leadership team, operational leadership team together um, about six to eight months into the into our journey. And we delivered the local leader playbook. And we just allowed people to vent and to voice. And what we could see is we could see teams that caught our attention that were either laggers or leaders. And then what we did was we, we allowed the safety team to spend additional time with them focused on closing the gap. So it, just as Beth said, the only way you're gonna move them is to engage them, to just continually show them, to support, because it's hard. It's, and the biggest question that came out of that was, so we're abandoning automatic discipline. That's what everybody wanted to know that there was comfort in that old behavior-based safety policy. And we had to say, yes, we are, we're moving away from that. But we use that to identify the people that needed our help, not the people that weren't on the bus. We put effort into getting them on a bus. You're on mute, Beth. I thought I unmuted. Okay. Another question from Dale Lambert. How do you separate issues of discipline when a safety violation occurs and providing a pass for bringing a near miss forward? So uh, I'm going to share something with you that is probably somewhat controversial. And um, so one of my colleagues in human performance, uh, one of the leaders in the human performance community, actually is coaching on trying to avoid the word violation. Why is he saying stop using the word violation? The reason, his reasoning behind it is that when you use that language, it closes down learning. It uh, makes a situation, a complex situation, it oversimplifies a complex situation and tries to make something that's gray and complicated, black and white and simple. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. And this is something that we're still working through. So again, I don't have all the answers on this one. And I'm sure we probably still say violate. But one example that we had recently was the idea of violating minimum approach distance. And so working with um, the safety researcher that we do at Ohio State University, uh, Asher Balkin, he said, he goes, well, you know, um, he goes, you've got a really complex situation that you're trying to manage with one rule. And I'm like, he goes, that doesn't work. He said, it's like trying to, uh, trying for a pilot, trying to land a plane, just giving him the wind speed. I'm like, ah, okay. Not saying that minimum approach distance isn't important. Of course it's important, but it's not enough. It's not enough to create safety. And so that's where this year, we're gonna actually be working on the idea of naturalistic decision-making, which is where we actually dig a little bit deeper and understand how experts are making those decisions. What are the other factors they're considering? And then we can begin to shape that naturalistic decision-making, the natural decision-making in the field of our experts. So I don't know if that answered, I hope it did. Uh, 
Okay, I think that's all of the questions that have come in. Thank you for submitting the questions and participating. It is uh, 1246, so we, we extended it a little bit longer than normal. Uh, again, the information uh, about the next webinar will be sent out to all the participants. Uh, we've also recorded this, so if you join late or want to share this information with some of your other colleagues, um, we'll send a follow-up link out so you'll be able to do that. And Beth's email address was on the last slide, elizabeth.lay at lewistree.com if you want to follow up with her directly. Thank you all very much for participating today. Thank you for Thanks, being with Beth. us today. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.